there's a microphone attached to the desk and there's a little area that says touch and you just need to keep the um, touch the button that says touch keep the red light lit while you're asking the question so the people on the web can hear the question if there is no microphone or if it's not working we'll try to come around with this portable mic um, so we make sure your question gets on the web um, question back there and use the mic because we are now webcasting is it necessary to hold down the button? Or yeah, you need to keep it. Okay. Um, the red light needs to remain lit okay. while you're asking the question. Thank you for clarifying. Um, those of you in the back, there are plenty of seats up here in the front row um, and a couple scattered elsewhere. Um, so anyway, without further ado, I'm going to um, introduce our speaker today. Peter Hurley works for the City of Portland's Bureau of Transportation, and he has been working um, for several months now on this new um, STARS system for rating transportation uh, project with respect to sustainability. We're very happy to have him here to kick off uh, this term seminar. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Peter. Thank you, Jennifer. And thanks, everybody, for coming out. I know some of you uh, are doing this for a class, but some of you are, are doing this by choice, and I appreciate that. Uh, I wish it had been just several months that I've been working on this, uh, but uh, there's a, a group of folks that have been working uh, as part of the North American Sustainable Transportation Council, uh, which is uh, uh, we hope to be a force within the industry over the, uh, the, the coming years and decades to make uh, stars a reality and I'll tell you a little bit more both about stars and about the group of people behind it so uh, sustainable transportation what the heck is it and what's the problem at least from our perspective uh, that caused us to start thinking about creating a system to try to address what we see as the the problems around sustainable transportation and I encourage you to to really think about what is sustainable transportation? Because it's really at the root of why we chose to try to create a, a system, a design and rating system, and why we chose to create the North American Sustainable Transportation Council. And it's a question that we continue to, to wrestle with and try to uh, define. What really is sustainable transportation and what do truly sustainable transportation projects look like? So problems. Uh, at least this is what I'm planning on doing, talking about what's the problem, what is STARS, uh, how does it work, what difference does it make or could it make, uh, and where we're going with this. And uh, to ask to uh, open it up for plenty of time for question and answer. But I'm also, I've done enough uh, presentations on the topic that I'm comfortable mixing things up. So if there are things that you want to hear about that are not part of this list, feel free to tell me now and I'll try to either work them in or add them on. So are there things that you want to make certain that we talk about today that you don't see generally under one of these topics? Anybody want to toss something out, make certain we cover, you know, talk about electric bikes or electric vehicles, and how those fit in, how uh, bike and pedestrian programs fit in. I realize this is the first day in the, uh, the first class, so uh, feel free as, as I'm going through if you do want to, to uh, raise a question. You don't have to wait until the end. Uh, did I put these out of order? I did. Uh, so what's the problem? Well, with uh, at least at the project level, uh, the general perceptions are that at least in urban areas and suburban areas that are growing, uh, we can have increased congestion on the uh, facilities, mostly roadway facilities, uh, and it leads to delay. Delay for people, delay for goods, principally during commute hours when there are uh, crashes, uh, when there are major events. So there, are, there is an economic cost to this. There's also an environmental cost, uh, increased consumption of fuel, increased greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, problems are often traditionally seen in terms of congestion and delay. One of the things that I've experienced over the last decade uh, as I've worked in, on major transportation projects in both Washington State and Oregon, which I think is not unique to the Pacific Northwest, is that a lot of times we'll go through a multi-year process 
of designing a transportation solution to a problem. And the cost of that solution will be so dramatic that it is unlikely ever to be constructed. And you can see that in a number of projects in the Seattle metropolitan area, Alaskan Way Viaduct, I-405, uh, the 5 520 Evergreen Point floating bridge, as well as closer to home. Uh, some people have raised some, I think, very legitimate questions about the cost of the Columbia River crossing uh, proposal and whether or not there will have you know, will there be $4.2 billion uh, to construct what has been proposed? And is that the priority for the, the use of those funds? We will see over time. But these are extraordinarily expensive projects in many cases, even at some of the, even at a smaller scale than the mega projects. And they raise questions about whether or not those will be built. Of all the projects that I've worked on, none of them have been built. Uh, anywhere near the scale that they were planned. They, were, they are being phased in at much smaller increments, $100 million, $150 million, $200 million increments. And it raises questions of whether or not if you plan for something larger and you build something smaller, are you effectively addressing the underlying problems that, uh, that were identified up front. We also have some significant issues with the amount of greenhouse gases that are emitted as a result, not just of building the projects. Building the projects, actually, the emissions that are uh, generated by building a project are pretty small. If you look at the full life cycle of a project, we just did an analysis within the Portland Bureau of Transportation that looked at all the emissions from ground transportation within the boundary of the city of Portland. And that included all of our activities within the Bureau the lighting in the buildings, the energy that it takes to make the asphalt, the commute trips of people coming to and from the building, the work trips that we take, including our flights. Anybody have a, a guess as to what percentage out of all the ground transportation, energy, and greenhouse gas emissions created by city of, uh, within the city of Portland, what percentage are the result of the Bureau of Transportation's actions and the various construction activities that occur within there. Anybody want to uh, take a guess? Okay, I, I see lots of puzzled looks. The answer is 1.5%. 98, or we're 98% of the emissions come from the operation of the transportation system itself. The cars, the trucks, the trains, the buses that operate on our transportation system make up 98% of the greenhouse gas emissions. So if you care about climate, and I sure hope you do, because I, it's my personal belief that climate is the defining issue for the next 50 years, because it has such dramatic economic, personal, and environmental consequences. So if you care about it, then focusing on the operation of the system is a really smart thing to do. Uh, Oil consumption is also a very significant economic issue and a health issue as well. Burning, burning oil or vehicles uh, does not do great things for our health. Uh, there, are, there are significant economic consequences as part of the analysis that the Bureau did of where our emissions uh, and our oil consumption are, uh, what the, the sources are. We also looked at how much money uh, we spend on oil in the area and how much money could stay in the local communities, potentially, if we reduced the number of oil-dependent trips. And looking at the top 10 strategies uh, that we could implement, demand management, system management, more people bicycling, more people walking, more people taking transit, looking at some realistic projections, we could keep about $130 million a year in the local economy. Uh, in the next, uh, by uh, the late 2020s, uh, if we were to implement a number of measures that reduce the amount of money we're spending on oil. So significant economic potential benefits by reducing our dependence on uh, oil. And then uh, uh, finally, the, uh, my experience has been with transportation projects that they tend to be planned as primary mode projects 
a road project or a transit project or a bike project or a pedestrian project. There are a few that look more broadly and are truly multimodal, but those are few and far between in the big scheme of things. And just as if, you know, if I stand on one leg and somebody comes up and pushes me, it's a good chance I'm, you know, I'm not particularly stable. When we focus on a particular approach, whether it's road only or transit only or bike only or pet only in a corridor and not recognize the diversity of trips that occur there, we're not creating as stable a system as if we have two or three points on which we base our solutions. And so these are some of the things that led us to conclude that we have a pretty unsustainable approach to access and transportation. And there's a group of us that decided that we wanted to attempt to bring a more sustainable approach to transportation plans, projects, and programs. And so part of the, the story of STARS is really the story of a group of people that decided we want to attempt to do for transportation what's been done for the green building, for, for the building sector. Now, pretty traditional sector, the construction uh, sector. And yet, over the last 15 years, there's been dramatic progress in bringing energy efficiency, healthy air, uh, improved design into construction to the point that LEED, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, is almost standard practice in various parts of the country. We have nothing like that in transportation, and we need something like that. So part of this is a story of uh, a group of people that uh, got together and said, we are committed to trying to make a difference and bring sustainability into transportation. And this is you know, a small, small group of folks. There are probably 30 others that have been part of creating STARS and the North American Sustainable Transportation Council. STARS stands for Sustainable Transportation Access Rating System. And the reason that the word access is in there is because really the purpose of transportation is usually to get access, to get access to another person, to get access to goods, to get access to information, to get access to places. Relatively few trips are taken just for the hell of it. Most trips are taken for a purpose to get access to something. And there are many ways of doing so. In some communities, if I want to go to the grocery store, I'd have to travel seven miles or 12 miles. Well, one thing to do to, to uh, make that trip possible is to create a road so I can drive seven or 12 miles to get access to the grocery store. If, on the other hand, we put grocery stores close to where people live, and it's a one-mile trip, I'm much more likely to walk or bicycle if it, than if it's a seven or a 12-mile trip. That's access. Access uh, is a broader way of thinking of solutions for transportation problems. So we deliberately put it in to the name. One way to think about uh, the system is it's kind of like lead for transportation leadership in energy and environmental design. It's a system that allows you to help design a better transportation project or to rate a project after the design is done. And we hope it to be as successful as LEED has been, uh, and hopefully as Living Building Challenge, which is the next step in uh, the evolution of building design and rating systems. We, want, we see it truly as a system something that applies not just to transportation projects, but also to plans and to programs. Programs like two of my colleagues, three of my colleagues actually are here, that provide information to people about what options they have in getting around. That's a smart trips program. And programs are the software of the transportation system. The roads, the bike lanes, the cycle tracks, the transit is the hardware, it's just as important that we have good software, good information for folks. So we want to uh, implicitly recognize that good information is a part of a sustainable transportation system. We see it as a voluntary system uh, and as a national system when we roll it out at the end of next year. 
both for public agencies that build the majority of transportation projects and develop the majority of plans, but also for the private sector. Uh, President Brinkerhoff, for example, helped develop a series of the climate and energy credits. CH2M Hill helped develop a series of the access credits. There are a number of other firms that have participated as well, uh, and hopefully they see that as an opportunity to use the system for transportation project design and rating. What are the core components? Well, uh, we have, it, the, we base the system on the core components of sustainability. Many of you have probably seen a diagram like this that shows the three E's of sustainability, an equity component, an environmental component, and an economic component. And I think this is actually quite critical because sometimes people hear sustainability and they think environment. Yeah, that's an, that is a, an important part, but the economic sustainability and the equity component are just as critical. And so when we were designing STARS, we looked to those three components of sustainability to design the system. And there is a rough analogy between the equity piece and one of the major parts of STARS, which is integrated process. What that really means is getting a good variety of people in the community engaged in planning projects and in plans. Well, there's a lot of effort to attempt to do this. One of the things that I've seen that's been particularly sus successful is when you ask people to participate and then actually give them the ability to have substantive input in the decision-making process rather than just participate in, you know, to uh, come to meetings. So we actually require, as part of integrative process, that the committee that's part of the project recommend to the decision makers various things, goals, objectives, uh, strategies for the project. We give uh, substantive authority to the people participating. Access is also defined somewhat differently. Sometimes access is defined as how much delay is there uh, in a transportation project, or you know, can, what's the capacity, can you in, uh, carry additional vehicles? Well, that's, that's valid. But it's narrow because there are a lot of people who choose not to own a car or who can't afford to uh, or who need to get around by other means or choose to get around by other means, walking, bicycling, taking transit and such. If you truly want to have equitable access, then walking, bicycling, taking the bus should be safe, convenient, and affordable. So is your project doing that? That's one of the things we measure. We also take a look at, of course, the environmental component by looking at climate and energy, fossil fuel energy in particular, and greenhouse gas emissions. We also look at the economic piece. You remember back when I, I was talking about how projects are often planned that uh, may be good, good plans, uh, but they're too expensive to implement? We require a cost effectiveness and a cost effectiveness analysis for the strategies that are part of the project. So right up front, we're saying, what's cost effective in there? Is it cost effective to do this smart trips program? Is it cost effective to add electric vehicle charging stations in the corridor? Is it cost effective to add one lane or two lanes or put that ramp metering in at one of the on ramps or off ramps? These are some of the things. This, the, program is grounded in the components of sustainability. It is explicitly multimodal. Uh, you cannot get STARS accreditation without looking at a range of options uh, that include pretty much the, uh, the full range demand management programs, system management programs, bike and pedestrian infrastructure, transit infrastructure, vehicle infrastructure. Uh, it is also explicitly full life cycle. And this is where it is different than a number of other good programs that are out there. Some of you may have heard of Green Roads being developed by the University of Washington and CH2M Hill. Very good program. If you've already decided you're going to build a road, you're going to add a certain number of lanes, and you just want to focus on the construction component. It goes much deeper and is much richer than STARS 
if what you're looking at is the construction imp impacts of a transportation project and you already know you want to build a road project. If, on the other hand, you want to look at the operations piece, the 98.5% of the emissions and oil consumption, I, I, as far as I know, this is the only program for transportation projects and plans that attempts to look at the full life cycle as opposed to the construction and design phases. Uh, and it is under development. We, uh, we have our uh, pilot project application manual uh, that is in final editing now. Uh, we should have the version 1.0 out and being tested uh, about November, the first week of November. You, I can't recall if we've actually posted this on the City uh, Bureau of Transportation website. But if any of you are really interested in digging into the credits and giving us some constructive feedback, I would be happy to uh, uh, provide you a copy and have you take a look at components of it. And I'll pass the sign-up sheet around later on. Question? I have a question on here. I have a question on your life cycle. Do you also, you know, this seems kind of backward, but do you consider, say, if a project was done by hand labor instead of, you know, machine labor or anything like that? What we do, because the, uh, the other uh, uh, phrase that I did not use on this is performance-based. Uh, the system is not based on evaluate this strategy, this strategy, this strategy, this strategy. It's based on uh, how do we, what strategies can you come up with to reduce the amount of energy and climate pollution from a project? What strategies can you come up with to improve access to people, places, goods, information? So while we do suggest some that you may or may not want to look at, and that one isn't in the list, we do have innovation credits. So if you come up with something that substantively reduces the amount of energy and climate pollution, we give you credit for it uh, and kind of celebrate that as well with an innovation credit. So it's, you know, you, if, if you want to look at electric bikes, which is not something we explicitly call out, and that's a viable strategy and a cost-effective strategy in the corridor, and you can show how, it, how you have a good solid plan to make it viable, We'll give you credit for it because it is a performance-based system. Good question. Other questions? I would like to uh, ask you, um, can the STARS and Green Road be combined to get a better product? Yes. Very good question as well. Uh, because STARS is thin on the construction side, if you really want to, to uh, dig in uh, to, what, to the design and emission implications of the construction project, using green roads is probably a, a good tool. Because STARS is much more comprehensive and looks at the full life cycle, if you want to use the two in combination, they can be a, a complementary tool. Thank you. Any others? Okay. So overall, our goal, both with STARS and with the North American Transportation Council, is to transform the way we practice transportation planning, uh, transportation project development, transporta transportation program development, in order to improve access. Wouldn't it be phenomenal if wherever you were in Portland or the metropolitan area or all of Oregon or most parts of the United States, if you truly had safe, convenient, and affordable options for the majority of your trips. So I think one of the reasons a lot of people live here, uh, one of the reasons I was drawn here, is that it is safe and convenient to be able to bicycle to work. It's not as safe and convenient for a number of other trips. And it's certainly, certainly uh, particularly uh, going to Clark County at this point in time. You can certainly do it. Is it uh, a 
safe, convenient, affordable trip or a, a timely trip. Not, not for a lot of the options we may want to use. So part of this is to uh, improve access for all people to a range of safe, convenient, and affordable options. Part of it is also to reduce the amount of oil that we're using, which is uh, truly unsustainable at this point in time, and keep some of the money that we're exporting uh, for that oil in the local community and to significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, because there's, uh, we are of the uh, belief that there is an imperative to reduce emissions and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions quickly. And that over the next several years, what we, because uh, many of those emissions will stay in the atmosphere for a uh, hundred years or so, that what we do now what we do tomorrow, in the next year, in the next several years, will make a significant difference on where those emissions peak. And if we can reduce that peak, it will have substantial benefits for agriculture, for the economy, for uh, people around the world. And uh, of course, to maximize cost effectiveness, I don't think there's going to be significant uh, hundreds of billions of dollars flowing from the federal government anytime soon to uh, bail out the various transportation projects that we planned over the years or from state government. That, and in fact, that may not be a bad thing if we are, uh, as transportation professionals, forced to become more cost conscious and cost effective in our work and really move the, uh, the industry toward true sustainability. So who's worked on this? Uh, a good mix of public and private sector organizations. Uh, we've had a uh, number of folks working on the credit development and a number of peer reviewers, Ashley Hare, for example, one of the, uh, the peer reviewers uh, for the system. Uh, and you know, wide, wide range of folks that were part of uh, coming up with the framework for the system in the first place. Who do we anticipate using this? Uh, primarily public agencies and consulting firms that work on transportation plans and projects. Uh, we anticipate that there, in fact, there are, have been a number of elected officials that have expressed interest in using the program as a way to uh, show whether or not their projects are sustainable and to show their commitment to sustainability. And then for the program piece, a number of employers have incentive programs for their employees uh, and are interested in how are we doing there? How do we compare with other major employers uh, or other small employers for that matter? How does it work? Well, there are various steps to, uh, to walk through. And I think at this point in time, the benefit for the people in the room is that I'm going to pass around the scorecard. There's a, uh, uh, on the front side of this is a somewhat superficial overview of the program. On the back side is actually the scorecard that lists all the credits and how they were put together. I'll give a brief description of uh, how the system, let's do it this way, how the system uh, flows and the credits Thank you, flow. Uh, the first set of, uh, the first actions that one would take is to put together a team of folks that represent uh, a multidisciplinary approach. So somebody that has knowledge and experience in bicycle and pedestrian facilities, somebody with experience in transit, somebody who knows stormwater, somebody who knows vegetation you know, habitat, uh, some folks that are familiar with the health implications of transportation projects, both the air quality and the uh, mobility, the mobile health uh, components. One of the more innovative pieces of this is that we then require that the uh, the uh, uh, proponent of the project host a sustainability workshop. So we ask them to bring people together, including the decision makers, including the elected officials, to have a discussion about how sustainability principles apply to a transportation project. I don't know of any other program that attempts to do this, but we really want to ground the discussion in sustainability. It looks like some people might not, uh, might not be enough. So with the, re the remaining ones, if you don't mind sharing with your, uh, with your neighbor, that would be a good thing so they can get all the way to the back. Uh, 
the sustainability workshop is really to ensure that the all the participants understand sustainability and have a shared idea of how it applies to the project. We then ask that the uh, group establish goals, also a fairly significant innovation. The goals for most transportation projects tend to be very general. Uh, we ask for something much more specific. What are your goals for the project in five years, 10 years, 20 years, and 40 years, so from the short term to 2050? Uh, what are your goals for reducing greenhouse gas emissions? What are your goals for improving access for all people across the various modes? And to establish those up front rather than doing the evaluation first. Because you can, if you establish your goals up front, you're much more likely to develop strategies to meet those goals. We then ask uh, folks to evaluate strategies, and I'm going to talk. I'll try to. I'll walk you through an example of what kind of strategies we encourage uh, projects to evaluate. Select alternatives. Do the implementation. The other piece of uh, the STAR system that I think is uh, particularly important is that we reward projects that monitor the performance of the system toward the goals and make changes. So uh, I don't know if any of you saw the this morning's Daily Journal of Commerce uh, had a, a, a headline uh, that green buildings can be greener. One of the things that LEED had, has introduced is uh, credits for monitoring the performance of the buildings. You might come up with a great design. But as in the, the case of uh, uh, the OHSU building in the south waterfront, it's actually consuming more energy than it was anticipated. Well, you can uh, tweak the systems to reduce energy consumption and have it perform closer to what the projections were. Very rarely is that done for transportation projects. So we put credits in the system that reward a project that actually does that monitoring and that adaptive management actually makes changes to improve the performance of the corridor. Uh, for those who uh, don't have the scorecard in front of you, this is just an example. There are uh, credits under the process category, access, climate and energy, cost effectiveness, ecological function, and innovation. Uh, it's a, a nice, nice way of uh, looking at the range of strategies. There are five required credits, uh, 24 optional credits. We don't anticipate any project is likely to get all 29 credits. Not all of them will be applicable for all projects. Uh, and the other uh, component that, I, that all, people often ask about is certification. We're anticipating that we'll certify at three different levels. The point at which the evaluation is done yeah, we want to reward projects that actually look at a range of options. So we will certify at the evaluation point. And often, because it takes a while to fund these, we don't want to have a project that may have done great work but wouldn't get certified for five years because they didn't get their funding for five years. So we'll certify at the evaluation level. We'll certify at the implementation point where they're actually uh, putting money into the infrastructure and the programs. And we'll also certify for projects that do monitor performance and make changes in the performance. I'm talking a lot. And I want to make check, check back in and see, A, are there any questions or comments or things that uh, you want to make certain that I cover as I wrap up the explanation? Yes? How do you plan on getting the budget? Got a question up here first and then in the back. So up front. Yes. Who's the entity behind this? Uh, the not exactly $100 million organization that you, the, the U.S. Green Building Council has become the North American Sustainable Transportation Council. So it's a, uh, admittedly a small group of transportation sustainability professionals in Washington and Oregon. 
that are the parent organization for the STARS program. At this point, uh, STARS is a partnership between three organizations. One is the Portland Bureau of Transportation that's been willing to invest a significant amount of time uh, in developing the, the program uh, to this point. The North American Sustainable Transportation Council, which is a group of uh, uh, professionals, both transportation and uh, sustainability professionals that are largely volunteering, in fact, completely volunteering their time to create this new organization, and the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission, which I will tell you in a few minutes why Santa Cruz County is engaged in this. But those have been the three organizations that have led the partnership uh, in the development of STARS thus far. Question in the back? Yeah. And press the, there you go, okay. I was, I was wondering how you guys were getting other funding and how you guys were raising money to do all this. Because it sounds really expensive. And other than uh, federal grants. It could be very expensive if people were not uh, volunteering a significant chunk of time. Uh, Santa Cruz County the Regional Transportation Commission has a project, a Highway 1 project, that the uh, RTC, Regional Transportation Commission, and the public both want to ensure is more sustainable. And the, they gave us a call back in uh, July 2009, said, you know, we saw this article about stars online. I'd, I'd written a really short article that appeared in one place. So how they found it, who knows, but I was impressed that somebody actually found it uh, and read, the, read what the idea was behind stars, because the credits weren't developed at that point in time, and uh, called up and said, we've got this project. The public wants it to be more sustainable. Our board members want it to be more sustainable. Uh, We've looked at the other systems, and we want to do more than just green up the project, you know, like you use recycled asphalt in the, uh, the mix. We really want to try to, to, uh, to take a significant leap forward. Would you guys be willing to help us? And we said, well, we've got a framework, but we don't have the credits developed at this point in time. So they were willing to uh, fund the development of the credits and organizations like CH2M Hill, Parsons Brinkerhoff, Confluence Planning, Eco Northwest, the economic consulting firm, were willing to develop the credits for probably, originally the idea was a third of what, it, uh, what their normal rates would be, but they ended up putting a lot more time into the development of the credits. Bureau of Transportation has put a lot of my time and time of some of the other uh, folks in the Bureau into it, and that's how we've got uh, what probably would be a million dollar uh, result for about a tenth of that. Other questions? Just a time check to let you know it's a quarter to one. Okay, so 15 minutes to uh, finish up? Is that? Okay, very good. So we'll see what is critical information at this point in time. Some of this I already talked about. Uh, we are uh, continuing to do credit research. So those of you who are interested potentially in helping out on some research, uh, we would welcome that. We need to complete credit development because not all the credits are done. The foundation credits are completed, but some of the ancillary credits are not. Uh, we also need to develop the certification and training system. We would like to get to the point, in fact, the intent is to get to the point where you or you or you could be a STARS certified uh, professional and work on transportation projects and be able to implement STARS. We don't want it to all go through the, uh, the Sustainable Transportation Council. We want to have folks in the uh, profession that are able to implement it. And we are looking at uh, a all to, uh, 2011 rollout for this to have completed the pilot phase at that point. So what about this? And uh, uh, I'm going to walk through the steps of what it might look like if you implement a STARS project. Uh, and I would not be doing this were it not for Nick Balbo, who uh, uh, helped out immensely in a very short period of time yesterday.
to uh, put together the, uh, the images here. So if there's any substantive problem, that's because of me. But anything that looks good, because of him. Uh, so uh, this is a, a, just a, a, an example. And this is uh, simplified in a very significant way. So uh, you know when you, uh, uh, before you use software, there's like 14 pages of legalese, and then you click I accept at the bottom. So everybody raise their hand. Come on, <laughs> put your hand up. So the 14 pages of legalese of all the caveats, like doesn't include induced demand, doesn't include population growth, and a whole variety of other things. Do you accept? <laughs> OK, so I'll go through this. Uh, typical problem, and this is only showing a single direction. You got a lot of congestion here. This is like morning commute. Uh, and the vast majority of those yellow vehicles drive alone. Yellow equals drive alone. Green equals carpool, van pool, bus, uh, walk, bike. There are a few walk, bike trips, a few carpool trips, uh, occasional bus trip. But the vast majority of the trips here, both on the highway and the on-ramp leading onto the highway, people driving alone. You know, it's a just spread out area. Lots of parking lots. and Residential is separated from the commercial over here, residential down there, no, no real easy access between the two, more commercial up above, more residential on the other side. So you know, this, is, this could be anywhere in the United States. Uh, so this is before STARS. Well, what happens uh, if you implement STARS? And STARS has five major strategy components to it. It says look at demand management programs, like the Smart Trips program. Look at system management tools, everything from ramp metering and uh, uh, queue bypass, signal synchronization, uh, automated uh, or uh, yeah, automated traffic management. Look at transit strategies, a whole range of transit strategies, streetcar, bus, uh, bus rapid transit, light rail, land use, one of my favorites. Now they, 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 we, there's been decades of discussion of bringing land use and transportation together and Sadly, it rarely happens. Now we're making an attempt to explicitly tie land use in and look at what are the access benefits, what are the climate and energy benefits to changing land use, and of course, vehicle capacity. You know, we, we uh, are perfectly comfortable with taking a look at what are the implications of adding lanes or ramps, making intersection changes as well. Uh, so, if you add travel demand management, what happens? Well, you get a few more. Carpools, a few more bike trips, a few more uh, bus trips. Our experience uh, with the city has been if you add demand management programs as part of a project, you can get more green trips, so to speak. When the interstate light rail was built, uh, there was decent ridership after it opened. As a result of adding demand management programs, we actually saw a doubling of ridership on Interstate Max. So it can make a significant difference either on a highway or a transit project. So you see, there's a few gaps now starting to open up as trips shift to carpool, van pool, bus, bike. Remember, I'm not including induced demand, latent demand, population growth, which actually are part of STARS, but tough to, to show on this. What happens if you then add system management? Notice over here, we added a uh, ramp metering that has a queue bypass for carpools, buses, van pools. So notice, yeah, there's a real incentive now for people using the on and off ramps to carpool, van pool, take the bus. There's less congestion on that ramp. Still quite a number of people that are driving alone, but you see a change, and you see a change in the number of trips on the highway as well. The number uh, drive alone trips diminishes a little bit. The number of uh, carpool, van pool trips increases. None of these are silver bullets. You know, it's the old, there are no silver bullets, there is silver buckshot. You, know, you have a little, few things that you start to add up over time. 8% here, 10% there. Soon you're talking real numbers. Land use. This is a big one. Notice, see that uh, just like in the Wizard of Oz, the, Oz, the building comes down. To the, uh, the mixed use building up there, uh, with these, with changes, with some financial incentives, 
and with changes in parking regulations, so you don't have to build as much parking, that piece of property is all of a sudden more valuable as a mixed use, maybe grocery store, office, residential, office, something along those lines. And notice there are now more bike and pedestrian trips as well, because all of a sudden you have better access to jobs or goods or places to live. The trips are shorter. You get more walking and bicycle trips. So again, you still have congestion on the highway, maybe a little bit less, but more walk-bike trips uh, in that immediate area. Well, what if you take the next step and you begin to build bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure? We've added a bike-pedestrian crossing right here so that people who live in the residential areas can get to some of the commercial development on the north side and vice versa. So you have more bike-pedestrian trips. We've added a crosswalk, some bike lanes, some sidewalks in the area so that those trips people can make safely, because safety is a, uh, a, a big deterrent to walking and bicycle trips, and improving access with the, with the ramp across. Well, what happens then? All of a sudden, you might see a conversion of the parking lot in the previous slide to another mixed-use building because you've got significantly better access to that site than you did previously. You've added value. And so with that come more bike, pedestrian, van pool trips, for example, if that's an office building, much more likely to see van pool trips, and a few less drive alone trips on the highway. And I thought there was one more in here. There's an infrastructure one, but did I get them out of out of line? Nope. Uh, so there is one, there, there is a big question. If you add HOV lanes in here, for example, does that, it's likely to improve flow. Are the benefits of improving the flow of vehicles, reducing the amount of braking and acceleration, going to outweigh the potential downside of all of a sudden more trips because the trip times are reduced? So that's a big question, and that's a question that STARS says you must answer if you want to get certified. And the answer may be different for different communities, but it is a very significant question, and each community will have to ask it. So if you go through STARS, you know, what's the potential difference that it could make? You know, here's a project before. Here's what it looks like after we did the demand management, system management, land use changes, took a look and added bicycle, pedestrian, transit infrastructure, and potentially that HOV lane as well. So with that, um, why don't we go to, uh, sorry, it's in blue. I couldn't figure out how to turn it, turn it white. But uh, you can contact uh, me or go to gettingaroundportland.org. And there are a variety of programs on there. One of them is labeled STARS, if you scroll down. I will also pass around a couple of sign-up sheets. Uh, we're going to, about once a month, once every two months, uh, send information out as the program develops. Or if you're interested in helping out with uh, some of research or have some ideas you want to share, go ahead and put your contact information on there as well. So questions, comments, constructive critique, yes? Hybrid cars, are they at all effective to what people thought they were? Hmm. <laughs> um, so, also, you, so I should probably... What's your, what's your opinion on it? Yeah, that, that's a better way of, uh, of asking the question because there are people in this... I'm, I'm thinking, I'm in a room full of folks that on almost every topic, my knowledge is broad and shallow. And some of you probably have deeper knowledge. So I'll express my opinion uh, of what I know thus far. And that is that it has been a technology that is helping to move us toward uh, cleaner vehicles, which is uh, potentially very positive. It, there, as far as I know, there's also been a bit of a rebound effect where uh, some people think, hey, I've got a clean vehicle. I can drive more. 
and I've actually experienced that anecdotally with some of my, my colleagues. And so uh, generally, my, ex my experience, my opinion is that technology can be a very positive uh, partner in moving towards sustainability, but that too often we tend to focus on technology as a solution rather than a partner in the solution. And to me, there are always the hardware and the software piece. The technology is the hardware piece. Human behavior is the software piece. And our perception of safety and convenience and affordability. And it's only when we match the two uh, in a thoughtful and systematic way that we're going to have really effective programs that we think about both the technology side and the people who are using the technology and doing so in a, a way that, that educates us and gives us real choices. Question? Other questions? Yes? That, uh, international, I don't know. National, there are a number of different programs that are being developed. Each one is somewhat different. So Green Roads that I mentioned earlier, New York State DOT has green lights. Uh, there is a program under development called STARS Community Index, STAR Community Index, which is more comprehensive. And uh, American Public Works Association and uh, Society of Civil Engineers and others are developing something around sustainable infrastructure. But as far as I know, and if any of you know of another one, let me know, this is the only one that attempts to look at uh, transportation life cycle sustainability. You got a question? Yeah, my question is um, sort of about why communities would want to do this. It makes sense to me that places like Portland and Santa Cruz would want to do this, but is there a good reason for maybe less liberal communities would want to jump on this? Hopefully, uh, if a community sees economic benefit in reducing the amount of money that they're spending on petroleum consumption, for example, even if you don't care about climate, uh, hopefully you do care about uh, the amount of money that's being spent on the, the vast amount of money, $1.5 billion a day throughout the US that we're spending on oil, oil consumption. Uh, that would be a compelling reason that some other communities may want to do so, as well as uh, making safe choices for walking, bicycling, uh, and safe and healthy choices for walking, bicycling, and other trips. On the land, the on the land use um, issue, is there any effort or intent to provide a STAR certification or stamp or nod to projects that aren't themselves transportation projects, like someone wants to put in a mixed use uh, development, LEED is a powerful marketing tool, are you interested in saying, you also satisfy our needs, let's put, it on, put our stamp on this? I'm planning on having a conversation with one of my uh, colleagues in the Bay Area whose uh, nonprofit organization is, has a, a system to reward projects at transit sites, transit-oriented development type projects to learn more about what they are doing and whether or not there's a potential complement with STARS. But at this point in time, given the amount of energy and time that it took to uh, get here, we're going to stay primarily focused on developing the, the credits, including the land use credit, which should be quite robust within this system. But to learn, are there other systems that we could partner with or encourage others to use? So thank you all. I really appreciate you taking the time, and uh, feel free to contact me. And the uh, 